We open up the episode with a storm, and they're talking about Danny's birth on Dragonstone also happening during a storm. It would be some poetic foreshadowing if the storm was the beginning of Daenerys, and also the end of Daenerys. I don't think this has to do with Euron bringing the storm, but the storm that is brought by the Night King instead. Unless, like I've mentioned in past videos, Euron ends up having some sort of relation with the Night King. You're not here to be Queen of the Ashes. Tyrion is talking about the entirety of Westeros, but in the same dialogue there's talk about King's Landing. Maybe what's being foreshadowed here is that something will end up turning to ashes, and that something will be King's Landing. This line was used for Littlefinger before, but I doubt it has anything to do with him in this scene. We can take the Seven Kingdoms without turning them into a slaughterhouse. Even if these guys don't want to turn it into a slaughterhouse, someone else does. The Night King. Or so it seems. Incompetence should not be rewarded with blind loyalty. I think this line may come into play later on. Maybe for Cersei or someone else. As long as I have eyes, I'll use them. This line could be foreshadowing that someone will lose their eyes. We already know that Euron likes to cut out tongues. Could he maybe cut out eyes as well? Or is this referring to the dragon who might get shot in the eye, as seen in a later scene? Carved up as an offering is being said while the camera is on Missande. We've always wondered if Missande will have a special role to play at some point. Could she be turned into an offering for a god? Varys has no reason to betray Danny, and it would be too obvious after having her accuse him so directly. Varys is probably a red herring for another betrayal. But even those who don't worship the Lord can serve his cause. To me, this hints at the Hound. And soon after, the prince who was promised is mentioned. Could this really be the Hound too? Missandei says that the noun Danny is translating into prince actually has no gender in High Valyrian. For a more in-depth discussion on this, there's a link in the description. But what this made me think of at first is that there's gotta be a reason why they're clarifying this in the show. And I thought it could mean that the prince that was promised will in fact be a woman. But after giving it more thought, I realized that if the gender of the word can change, then maybe it means that there will be more than one prince or princess that was promised, and they will be of different genders. It could very likely be John and Danny, just as Melisandre is suggesting. Although I still just wanted to be the Hound. <laughs> I should also add that there's a character in this story who has also sort of switched genders back and forth, and that is Arya. But nothing in her storyline has given me any hints that she could be the prince or princess that was promised. I just thought it was a cool little thing to point out. Davos talks to Jon about not having enough men to fight the White Walkers, and that fire-breathing dragons could kill them. Then we're taken to a scene where someone else, Cersei, also doesn't have enough men to fight, and there's also someone else in this scene who the dragons could kill, the lord she's talking to. There's more foreshadowing for this later on, but the connection between these two scenes is probably more simple. In both of them, they're discussing what to do about Daenerys. When Cersei talks about the Mad King inflicting horrors upon his people, we're shown Jaime, and he's probably remembering how he killed the Mad King because of that. But this could again be foreshadowing that Jaime will have to do the same again, if Cersei starts acting more and more like the Mad King. When Cersei says she fed them to her dragons, we're shown Randall and Dacon. I love this foreshadowing, and it's the one I mentioned in number 10. Jaime mixes up Dacon with Rickon, which was a line probably meant to simply let the audience know who this new actor is, since Dacon was played by a different actor before. But it also makes me wonder if the writers wanted to make a connection between the two characters' fates. I've always felt pretty confident that Dickon will die, but is it possible that he gets killed by an arrow, just like Rickon? I think we will find out in the fourth episode, but we shall see. We go from one Tarly scene to another Tarly scene, so the connection between these two is easy to see. But what if there's something else here? The last thing Jamie says is, summarized, when the war is won, I can think of no better man than Randall Tarly. Could the director be wanting to connect this line to the Tarly we see next? Just switch the name Randall for Samuel, and you can definitely see what I mean. I can see the show doing one of their many line callbacks in season 8, having John say to Sam what Jamie just said to Randall. But instead of the war for the Iron Throne, they'd be talking about the war against the dead, and Sam would get some sort of high recognition for what he did to help win that war. 
The connection between this scene and the next isn't very clear, and maybe the director didn't mean to add anything special here, but I can still come up with some ideas without the need to reach too far. Jora says, I've been dead to them for years, and the next scene is about something that has been dead to people for years as well, dragons. This could be foreshadowing that just like the dragons, Jora will come back, woken out of stone. So there's that, and then there's a possibility that Jora will be the first to discover these dragon killing weapons, or the first to be affected by them, something like that. Kyburn says that the finest blacksmiths have been working on this weapon. This could be foreshadowing the return of Gendry. Maybe Gendry will be the one to reveal to someone the news about these weapons being built, because he was working on them. The connection between this scene and the next is again very easy. They're talking about the dragons, and then we see Danny, the one who owns the dragons. We could refer to Danny as a dragon. Could they be telling us that Danny is the dragon who gets impaled by the weapon? Or could it be the dragon that Danny will be riding, Drogon, that gets impaled? I'm not sure, but I get a feeling that I'm reading too much into this and the connection is as simple as my first explanation. But we shall see. Maybe the reason a dragon gets shot with that weapon is because Danny decides to be a dragon, like Olena tells her in this next scene. Telling Sam, if you're going to write history you need a bit of style, could be hinting at that theory that it is Sam who wrote the history of what is going on in his time, the history of a Game of Thrones, or a Song of Ice and Fire, especially after he implies that he would write with a poetic style. Ebros is the one writing the story after Robert Baratheon, so Sam as his apprentice could definitely either include his own research, or finish it, or rewrite it. Got any ale? This is a callback line from the Hound, and it could be foreshadowing that Arya will also meet the Hound again, but also this is obviously showing how much the Hound has rubbed off on her. Hot Pie says, I'm like you, Ari. I'm a survivor. This might be telling us that Arya will survive this season. Touch my sister and I'll kill you myself. This line makes me feel like Littlefinger will in fact touch Sansa, but it might not be Jon saving his sister, it might be Arya. They hint at it once again by, just like in the first episode, showing an Arya scene right after a little finger scene. In the scene between Arya and Nymeria, there is yet another line callback when Arya says, that's not you, which is what she had said to Ned in season 1 when Ned wanted her to be a lady. But there's some extra foreshadowing here. The fact that Nymeria is now too wild to go back home and go back to her old pet life tells me that this is the same thing that's happening to Arya. She might be headed back home, but she's changed too much to be able to go back to her old life. She won't be able to settle back there again. It's funny how after the scene with the direwolf Nymeria, the first voice we hear in the following scene is that of Nymeria Sand. Just a cool connection there, but the foreshadowing is clear for the two sand snakes that say Ilaria is not their mama, especially when Tyene says, maybe I'll kill you both before we take King's Landing and then I won't have to share. They are clearly the two sand snakes who are going to die soon after. A quick shot of Theon holding Ilaria's mug, where we can see that he's missing some fingers, is probably meant as a subtle reminder of what happened to him, which plays a role later on in this episode when Theon's PTSD gets triggered by what's going on around him and he jumps off the ship without saving Yara. Although I think that the fact that Euron is asking for it means that Theon will eventually give it to him. He will come back eventually and avenge his sister. At least that would be some of that poetic justice that we all like so much. That is all for now guys. Leave a like if you like this video, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one!